Across the state, erosion is eating away at our pristine shorelines. Beaches are starving for sand due to a number of causes. Those can range from sea level rise to the effects of structures designed to protect buildings rather than the coast. As homes, hotels and highways sit precariously at the water's edge, can a comprehensive solution be found to save our beaches? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. Hawaii is known around the world for our iconic beaches, but many are disappearing right before our eyes. Each year, beachfront properties and roads are threatened of being washed away with every pounding of large surf or battering by storms. A study from researchers at the University of Hawaii at Manoa School of Ocean and Earth Sciences and Technology found that 40% of Oahu beaches could disappear over the next 30 years if coastal management policies are not changed to better protect our shorelines. Our panel tonight will discuss how we can keep our beaches from vanishing. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email or call in your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Shelley Habel is a coastal geologist with the University of Hawaii Sea Grant Program. She's also contracted as the Coastal Lands Program Coordinator for the Department of Land and Natural Resources. In her role, she provides support on issues like beach conservation, appropriate coastal land use, and regulatory permit review. Chip Fletcher is an Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and a professor in UH Manoa School of Ocean and Earth Sciences and Technology. He's also the chairperson of the Honolulu Climate Change Commission. He and his students have published more than 120 peer-reviewed articles on beach processes, the natural history of Hawaii Hawaiian reefs and impacts of sea level rise. Lauren Blickley is based on Maui and is the Hawaii Regional Manager for the Surfrider Foundation. The nonprofit works to protect the world's oceans, waves, and beaches. It was formed in 1984 by a group of surfers in Malibu, California, who were concerned about environmental threats from coastal development at their favorite surf break. And Presley Wan was born and raised on Oahu but moved to Kauai in 1979. He's a board member with Malama Kua'ai. The organization works to support preservation and protection of Kauai's natural and public resources. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's great to have you. Chip, I want to start with you and that report that says that all of those resources could disappear in such short time. When we talk about having the beaches essentially vanish, what does that actually mean? What does that look like? Well, really, it boils down to... Um, as you describe, protecting the human development that is located on the Malka side of the shoreline, protecting roads, uh, homes, um, assets that we have spent money putting in under a system of laws that did not until very recently recognize the fact that sea level is rising. We've known for many, many decades that the ocean is rising. And, you know, a third grader will understand the fact that if the ocean is rising, the shoreline has to migrate landward. Otherwise, it will get drowned. And uh, for geological reasons, much of the land immediately adjacent to our beaches is actually very sandy land. And the rising ocean will erode that land, it will release the sand, and the beach uh, can continue to migrate with the rising water. The problem is, We've uh, developed and built on these precious lands um, to the extent that now the, um, the de facto permit system, the real permit system that operates, not the one that's written down as what the objectives are, but the real permit system is strongly biased in, in favor of protecting individual parcels of land uh, where landowners um, have put their dwellings or, or own that land. Now, I'm stating this very strongly. Um, individual cases certainly are exceptions to that, but if you look over the long history of coastal zone management in Hawaii, just the fact that we have lost miles and miles of beach uh, is a testimony to the fact that the system is, uh, has not really worked. And it's because it's fundamentally based on a flawed assumption that the shoreline is going to be stable. 
But with rising sea level, it won't. It has to migrate. And when you talk about that 40%, is there a particular part of the island that is more vulnerable than others? Well, that that study looked at the backshore land uses and made assumptions based on historical permitting of seawalls and other protective uh, devices to protect the land. Uh, what would be protected uh, in the future and what would not? And our assumption was that undeveloped land would be allowed to erode, but roads, um, buildings, uh, other developed assets, which uh, represent you know, the investment of our treasure, uh, would not be allowed to be destroyed by the migrating shoreline and would be protected with some sort of sandbag or seawall or whatever. And we know that that kills beaches, especially when sea levels rise. Shelley, we were talking with Chip about Oahu, but what other areas of the state are most vulnerable right now? Oh, I guess uh, West Maui comes to mind. Um, there's also parts of, uh, I guess it would be East Kauai. Um, the areas of like Kapa'a are facing a lot of erosion issues. Um, so yeah, we're seeing exactly what Dr. Fletcher describes is, is um, that dwindling away of the shoreline as you have that coastal squeeze. So you have like long-term chronic erosion that's moving that shoreline inland towards something that's fixed, like a house or a road. And so, yeah, um, we're, we're starting to see that play out along our shorelines in real time. And what can be done to mitigate that in real time? You know, we talked about, he mentioned some of those mitigation measures, um, but those can end up doing more harm than good. Right, um, yeah, and so, yeah, we're, we're Erosion is a really tricky issue because you can't stop it. Um, so sea level rise is causing this chronic erosion, just like uh, you can't stop a hurricane. You can't stop that inland retreat of the shoreline. Um, there's a relationship, like a coastal geology relationship called the Bruin Rule um, that kind of simplifies that relationship of the shoreline moving inland where um, every increment of sea level rise you have causes a landward shift in um, that coastal that coastline by 50 to 100 times that amount and so one foot of sea level rise would equal 50 to 100 feet of loss so you can't really stop that marching inland of the coastline um, what you have to do is manage it and so there's mainly three ways of managing it one way is hardening which we know from what doc, dr fletcher mentioned like it's really degrading to the beaches Two is restoration projects like beach and dune restorations, where you add sand to the beach, you move that out to a historical footprint. And then the third is retreat. Whether or not that's managed is another thing. Mm -hmm. Lauren, let's talk about those measures a little more deeply. It's very interesting to hear them laid out one by one like that. You uh, gave us a photograph that I wanted to call up of a, of, a, of a condo on Maui that I think really showcases the problem. Can you tell us about what they did there and, and what we can learn from it? You know, this is the picture that you're looking at. It's the Royal Kahana, and this is an area that Chili just mentioned. West Maui is one of your, your hot spots, right? It's one of the areas all the way from like essentially Ukumehame all the way up along West Maui um, is eroding. And not only that is we have condos, we have infrastructure, we have roads that are in imminent threat of the coastline. Um, with Royal Kahana, the, the El Nino year of 2015, 2016, really impacted that coastline significantly and that corner that you saw of the building like I can stand there and stretch my arms out that's about how far that corner of the building is from the sandbags and I think that right now the sandbags are in and there's a proposal to have a series of, of tea groins along there um, but it's it's this this issue that as Surfrider Foundation we're really running up against as a advocacy organization of ultimately we have to move back and every single thing that we're doing can buy a little more time but as chip was kind of talking about earlier ultimately the ocean's going to win it's always going to prevail whether we hold it off for five years 10 years maybe 50 years 
Um, so in these instances, you know, Surfrider specifically is trying to push for, okay, if we have some of these projects go in, if we have sandbags go in, how do we get them out? Eventually, those are in for an emergency permit, um, and they're supposed to be there for three years, and they've been there longer than three years. Um, and then the challenges of like, well, what do we do now? What if we take them out? That building's going to fall in, and what is the, what do the consequences look like? So, like Shelly was saying, it's super complicated. Um, it's really, really challenging. And beyond the sandbags, things like groins that you mentioned or seawalls that homeowners have put up, and a lot of those ones we know at least on uh, Oahu were put in in the 50s and 60s when people perhaps didn't know as much or uh, were not as aware as they are now. What are the consequences of having seawalls, for instance? Let's look at specifically at that one because it's something that a lot of people can see at, the, at their favorite beach. Uh, when we have those, what happens to the beach? We lose it. You don't have a beach, you know, that's what we found with, with seawalls is seawalls are, I think it was um, Dr. Fletcher has probably written a paper on it showing how seawalls just continue to exacerbate the erosion. And that's another part, you know, just, just to the north of that picture that you saw um, is a stretch of, of seawalls. So those seawalls have exacerbated and created that issue at Royal Kahana and now Royal Kahana all the way down to um, Pohaku Beach Park are dealing with. Presley, I want to bring you on on this. So this idea of retreat, um, it is heartbreaking for a lot of us to look at that and think about some of the places that we love so dearly, essentially being, um, I don't know, given to the sea, if you will. What's your take on all of this? Well, um, first of all, uh, all my all my knowledge comes from what I've seen and experienced. I'm not a scientist by any means. Um, all I am is like my ancestors, uh, an observer. And being a waterman for, you know, 64 of my years of my life, I've witnessed and felt a lot of changes, yeah. And so I think, um, like you said, it's, it's sad to see, to watch. I've, you know, I'm 72 years old. I've, I've seen a lot and uh, surfed all Waikiki and all over this whole state. But what, what my friend told me, to address your question is that my friend Rupert Rowe told me one time, he said, you know, he used to tell me it all the time. He said, you know, a lot of our answers to the future are in the past. So I think that's part of the problem with, with the powers that be, um, that they're not recognizing, you know, culture and traditional knowledge when they, when they started with these permitting, we got to look to the, we got to look to the past for it the answers to the future. Our, our, our kapuna, they never built by the ocean. They never, they never lived by the ocean, really close to the ocean. They go inland, you know, but they never built on the sand dunes. They never lived on the sand dunes. They would have, they would have hollies, maybe a canoe holly or your, you can keep your fish nets on the sand dunes. But in the process of progress, we, we've, we've, wipe out one of the most important things that we had as a uh, natural resource and a lot of, of the problems that uh, we face today are because this, we had sand dunes. There were, there were a lot of sand dunes all over like Hawaii, right, right down here in Kapal, like Shelley was mentioning, right? Our highway is really endangered. But the, at, in, in antiquity, the right there on the shoreline, right in front of Cocoa Palms were, were sand dunes that were 30, 40 feet high. They're gone because we leveled it to make a high highways. We level properties to make it more valuable, make it more appealing, you know. So, so we have, you know, taken away that, that reserve that's been, uh, would replenish because our Kapuna knew that things like this are going to happen. We've only been on this earth that just a speck of sand in, in the whole, you know, the whole scope of this earth, you know, so we, we don't really know all of all the things that we think we know. So anyway, that's, I, th I think we're just going to have to, like Shelly said, retreat. You know, I, I think uh, that's the, that's going to be the ultimate lesson that we're going to have to definitely consider. Well, Chip, on that issue of retreat, there's a question here from um, 
Dr. Satoris, I think I'm butchering this, Elizabeth Satoris, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. She says, why are there no serious plans to move our most vulnerable coastal roads further inland? Um, almost all of the panelists have mentioned various roads on almost every island that are vulnerable. Is there a plan in place or should there be more planning in place to actually move the roads? Uh, well, first, I want to compliment Presley for really a beautiful description of the situation, Presley, and you're you're absolutely right. Um, there's nothing going on here that has not been known for many generations by people who watch nature. And you say you're not a scientist, but I beg to differ. Uh, anybody who watches nature is a scientist. Um, and indigenous knowledge, scientific knowledge, uh, there are lessons to be shared in both directions, I think. And, and just as sort of a sidebar, um, it's been shown that a lot of the uh, sand in these dunes was actually taken during the plantation era and you can bake it and make lime out of it and it becomes a fertilizer. So uh, a lot of the dune uh, robbery, if you will, was done during the plantation time and then uh, there was more sand taken from our dunes uh, to be used in laying out roads. Um, it's been used in construction. Sand is actually a very va valuable resource. And, um, and now, you know, we're, we're paying for the fact that we have not seen sand as a valuable resource. It hasn't been properly valued from an economic point of view, from a social point of view. Um, and Yanji, getting back to your question about, uh, I'll get to the roads in a second, but you know, uh, this idea of retreat threatens to, to become the latest chapter of land theft in a long history of land theft in Hawaii, right? Um, because the ocean is now moving on to areas where we have placed a lot of communities. And government is at risk. If government comes down to relocate these communities with a top-down approach, uh, it threatens to become a land theft situation. There, there is a process where you enter a community, you listen to their stories, you allow the community to share uh, their history, what they have learned. It's a multi uh, chapter story. It's a it's multiple visitations between a community, between policymakers, between scientists who can act as resource people with regard to sea level rise and the impacts. But ultimately, our coastal communities, and so of so many of them are underserved by by government. Our coastal communities should be in charge of their future in the context of the larger community. Um, does that sound like a complex process? Yes. Have we gotten started on it? No. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be expensive, but it does have to involve time and engagement and reaching out. Um, with regard to the roads, the Department of Transportation has uh, uh, a pretty detailed study that you can find online. They've identified every segment of coastal roadway uh, that is under the jurisdiction at the state level. Uh, and they even have identified uh, alternatives for what to do to that road. You could raise the road, basically make it a low bridge and let the water wash underneath it. You could relocate the road completely. Um, and they, they also have estimates for some of the costs. If I remember correctly, maybe Shelley can uh, correct me, but I think the total combined cost of our coastal highways that are threatened with sea level rise is something like 15 billion or 19 billion. Um, it's it's Imagine. around yeah it's around that teens of billions of dollars extremely expensive and you know one place where we might make great headway on this is the infrastructure bill slowly moving through Congress uh, it's it has the potential to bring large amounts of money to get started on that problem. Shelley, I want to bring you in uh, for this question from Ingrid. She asked via Facebook, when Honolulu areas flood, the Star Advertiser refers to high tides and king tides being the cause. I don't remember this happening growing up here since the early 60s. Isn't this flooding really a result of sea level rise? I have to agree with Ingrid. I grew up in Hawaii, and I don't ever remember king tides being part of the conversation uh, when I was a kid, but maybe I just missed those conversations. Can you tell us a little bit more about this phenomenon? Yeah, it's that's a really good question. Um, 
Yeah, so what king tides are, um, the definition, like the true definition of them is just the highest tide of the year caused by the sun and the moon lighting up. That's it. It's the highest tide of the year. And so when you have uh, that regular tidal cycle on top of what is rising sea levels, then you get higher, like more and more extreme king tides uh, as you go forward in time. And so, yeah, they, as far back as you go in time, they've had king tides, but they're becoming more extreme. And so they're starting to make headlines. Interesting there. Um, Lauren, I want to bring you in on this. Uh, Michael on Maui asked a question about some of these mitigation measures. He says, have you considered using grow-ins rather than seawalls? I'd never heard of a grow-in. He says a grow-in are angled seawalls to divert the surge of waves and prevent wa backwash. Is that something that could be considered? I'm going to defer that to the engineers, but from a surfrider perspective, we don't support any engineering in the coastal area. So we, what we do support in certain cases would be beach renourishment, like on small scale and like case by case. Um, the other thing that we would support are like, like natural living systems, right? So dune restorations that Chelly had talked about before, restoring what the natural coastline is going to do. Um, I think the, the challenge, and I'm, I'm not a coastal engineer, but what I envision even um, something sloped is, is still not giving the beach the ability to, to move and migrate. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that Presley brought up the importance of observation because I'm a surfer and I go down to my favorite surf spot and you, you know, you look at it and you're like, oh, there's a lot of sand on the reef. You know, like at the beginning of summer on the South Shore, I'm like, oh, there's a lot of sand. And by the end of the summer, I'm like, oh, there's not, you know, I like almost take it for granted because you're just, you're constantly just, uh, I guess, in tune with it. And one of the things that we've been talking about as our surf rider chapters is how to better connect and in, in cases reconnect people to that coastline um, and better start observing because then we're like, how do we make this? important for people because what we're seeing now is this shifting baseline right so the beaches that you had when you were younger versus what i had when i was younger versus what my daughters are going to have it shifts so we we start to get okay with a beach with the seawall where you can't walk at high tide and that is creating i think a lot of the issues too is that we're be becoming disconnected from that sand we're and it, it, it is so funny, but like, Chip, I'm glad you mentioned how important sand is because I love sand, right? But the reality is, is that sand is critical and we take it for granted. Um, and I think it's really important for us to be observant of it because then we can see how it interacts with seawalls, with sandbags um, and what we're losing and what we've lost. Chip, let's bring Michael's question to you then about this issue of grow-ins and also just on the issue of sand and replenishment. You know, one of the most sort of uh, well-known sand replenishment happens, it seems like every few years at Waikiki, and we see these bulldozers coming in just piling on the sand. Um, is that a worthy effort? We know that, of course, for the tourism industry, this is the jewel of our economy, if you will. Um, but can we pump in enough sand to keep this going? Uh, well, the direct answer to the last bit of your question is that it's going to go grow. It's going to grow more and more expensive as sea level rises higher and higher. To hold the shoreline is going to become increasingly expensive and difficult. Um, so I'm not sure what a grow in is. Are uh, potentially that is the word groin. A groin is a seawall. That's what that I was wondering. Perpendicular, but then there is also the idea of using uh, plant growth with very deep roots, uh, which is just a vegetated seawall in my mind. Anything that binds up the sand and prevents the waves from getting to it really doesn't help the situation. But then it also seemed like you were describing uh, instead of a vertical wall, a sloping wall, and, and we call that a revetment. So a vertical wall is a seawall. It has a small footprint, and so when you place it on a beach, it doesn't bury a lot of beach underneath the cement. A revetment can have a two to one slope on it, which means you bury a lot of sand under the revetment. 
The waves dissipate their, the energy as they run up the revetment and come back down again. The idea is that there's not as much erosion taking place. And indeed, at low tide, in front of many revetments, you'll find a little strip of wet sand and people will desperately, in my mind, point to that and say, look, the beach is doing just fine. All of this is preventing the shoreline from migrating landward. Anything that prevents the shoreline from migrating because sea level is rising, the shoreline has to migrate, you're interfering with nature, you're interfering with natural processes, beach processes, and it's not going to be good for the beach. So how do you approach the problem differently? You place sand there. And there are a lot of ways to sort of value that approach. Uh, in Waikiki, uh, thus far, the state has made the decision based on economics, right? There's four to six million dollars spent to put a, to put a, a beach in, uh, and four to six million dollars is spent by tourists from Britain in the space of two months or something, right? You know, four to six million dollars is, is, is a very good cost for the enormous benefit that you get purely from an economic point of view. Uh, where you have a beach, you also uh, preserve the public trust of access to and along the shoreline. That's important to be able to get to the surf spots, to go surfing. But if you put in too much sand, which has been claimed, um, you can actually, that sand will head offshore and it will soften up or even destroy, destroy the surf. Um, so it's, it's a delicate decision. Waikiki, the decision is largely economic and some other location, maybe, you know, economics is not the right decision to make. It's not the right value to place on it. Presley, we've been talking a lot about the, the economics, you know, what is lost when we lose, we lose land values. Um, in the case of Waikiki, we could lose tourism dollars. When we lose these spaces, when we lose this coastline, what else is lost? C can you talk a little bit about the intangible, if you will, um, as these spaces go away? Um, that's a tough question. Um, I think I'm going to have to defer that one too. <laughs> well, Dr. I just mean from a, from a cultural perspective, when we lose these spaces, perhaps we lose fish oh, ponds, perhaps well, we yeah. lose well, um, stories, yeah. you know, things like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, the, one of the things I'm really proud of and I'm very involved with is, um, we have a nonprofit on the North shore of Kauai. It's called, uh, Hui Makaina Na O Makana. And we are located inside the state park in, in Haena. And there's no urban development. There's no, no, um, yeah, there's no, there's nothing built on the, on the ocean and on our sand dunes there. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a good example of how it should be because what happens, the wind in Haena, where, I, where I'm from, my Hawaiian side of the family, we're from, the North Shore on, on um, Kauai and a very cl close community. And we're very um, passionate about taking care of our resources. So this, the, the sand migrating and the beach migrating also affects our fisheries, which we were um, really um, proud of being one of the, uh, well, being the first community based subsistence fishing area in the state. Um, so being losing losing the the ocean and the even the access because we're we're having that further up um, towards Hanalei as you start getting into the more um, beachfront properties we're we're losing our access to to go fishing because a lot of um, there's been a couple of homeowners that have actually used sandbags as a, as a, a means to um, protect their property. You know, they're not, we're not thinking about protecting our, our beach, our beach um, access and our beach, our beaches are in um, basically uh, over, over property, uh, saving the property. So we're, we're, we're losing our access, some of our accesses, they're a little harder to get to some to walk the shoreline to throw net. So it has a, there's so many, there's a lot of impacts it's culturally for us, especially. Um, I can't really speak for any any other community, but um, for Haena, we we can see how how it's pretty un, pretty untouched in the majority of the that shoreline. 
So, um, and uh, one of the things too the state is doing is actually looking at, uh, we, uh, we have a really good work, working relationship with the, the state of Hawaii in parks division. And so what, we, what they're looking at is where we're, the ironwood trees, that's, um, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our shorelines, especially on Kauai, where the ironwood trees are just dropping left and right. You know, Wainiha, uh, Hanale, uh, Haena, uh, oh, this, there's a lot of tree ironwoods going down. And, and so we got to be careful too, how we plant veg, uh, um, our, 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 we got to put more ground cover actually is what I'm, what I'm trying to say, like our, our uh, Ilima, you know, but anything under our ironwoods got to go. They're, they're really detrimental because anything that, any kind of a, a, a beach cover would, um, they can't survive in that pine cone bedding, that, that, that pine bedding under the ironwood. So, so um, we're, we're going to drop, we're looking at dropping off some of the ironwood trees there and then putting back our native beach, beach plants. Yeah. That traditionally, and, and ec this took care of the beach. Yeah. So anyway, I, yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Those ironwoods are invasive, and yeah. they drop the needles and they make the sand uh, yeah. acid. It yeah. turns into acid soil. Nothing can grow there. The shade is intense. Nothing can grow there, and you need ground cover to prevent the wind from blowing the sand away. Right. So I mean, Presley's pointing out sort of multiple timescales here. There's like managing the beach and the dune for you know today and the next couple of years, and then there's sort of several decades with sea level rise and shoreline retreat. These are two different management issues and they're, they're, they each are thorny, but they need to be identified as, okay, what are we going to do for, you know, this immediate generation of children who need to learn how to swim in the ocean and the way they get there is through beaches, is by going across beaches. They need to learn how to surf and survive in the ocean. When our beaches are gone, the local children don't get a chance to pick up those skills. Um, so we need to manage the beaches now and for today's children, but then we need to make sure beaches are here in the future. And that means this strategic retreat idea with, we have to pick up our assets and, and move away from the shoreline and let it behave in a natural way. Yeah, Chip, that's a really interesting point. And I'm thinking of just beaches on the windward side here on Oahu are just surrounded by ironwood trees. And it's not just this island, of course, other islands as well. Um, are there measures in place to try to do the kind of work that Presley's talking about where we plant the right ground cover? Are there organizations or are there ways that people can actually get involved and do that? Because I think when you see a show topic like this, it can feel really defeatist. You feel like you can't do anything and that the ocean's going to come and do what it's going to do. But um, are there ways to stop this with moves like that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's so many service oriented projects that can be done. Um, and Presley's been talking about a great example of these. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, but before you get there, you also need to let the government tree people know that those ironwood trees are not worth protecting by building a seawall in front of them. Believe me, I've been, I've gone out in the, uh, in the field with arborists, our, our, our government arborists, and I've had to argue with them and say, those invasive trees are not worth killing the beach by putting a wall in front of the trees to preserve them. So there's a lot of education that needs to go on too and, and assumptions that, uh, that need to be identified and then uh, new mindsets put in place. And I, can I add something on that really quick? Um, one of the things that's been interesting in this conversation that I've been having over the past couple of, of months as well is um, how we approach resource management. So there's like the very Western mindset right, that obviously hasn't done a very good job of our resource. And then there's like the traditional knowledge, which is, is holistic. And even when you look right now at how we're managing the coastline, like it's essentially a single system, but it's bifurcated. So um, Malka of that high tide line, that's, that's county. And then Makai of that high tide line is state and even a little bit of federal thrown in there. And I think that's one of the things that we have also been really trying that adds a lot of challenges. And it's also, again, not, not the traditional way of 
approaching the coastal zone. So at a state and county level, and when we're trying to implement these projects and programs and, and talk about managed retreat and a, pro, a statewide managed retreat program that's equitable and that's feasible, it's kind of like also flipping the mindset that we've been going with for the past, you know, since the 40s of that very Western, uh, divvying everything up and, and going to that more holistic and like Presley was describing in, in a, of, of looking at it as an ecosystem as a whole. That's a great point. Today's coastal management system manages parcel by parcel by parcel. And so we take an ecosystem and we manage it by this homeowner wants a permit to do something. And then there's another homeowner way down here and wants a permit to do something. And getting these permits can take years. And the whole thing is disjointed. Uh, you have different jurisdictions of government and you are breaking up an ecosystem in a totally non-natural way. I, I also wanted to just sort of underline something Lauren said earlier. There is a process uh, whereby you build a seawall here and you cause a accelerated erosion next to it. So then that person puts a seawall in front of their property and then you get accelerated erosion on the third property. This is called flanking. And if you look at the history of seawall construction on many, many community shorelines, it's a domino effect. After about a decade and a half, you just have a mile of seawall one permit at a time. And the this process of flanking is defined by an equation. And the major parameter in the equation is, well, what's the length of hardening that you have updrift of where your uh, new, newly unprotected and rapidly eroding shoreline is? So the erosion gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And this isn't this is only just now starting to be recognized, literally just this year and last year. Um, in the coastal zone management um, regime that we have in Hawaii. Well, Shelley, if we continue to see this problem from seawalls, is there a mechanism to have them removed and who has the authority to actually do that? Well, um, gosh, as of I think last year's legislative session, um, Act 205A, um, which is the coastal zone management um, rule, um, it was updated so that hardening of shorelines uh, along sandy shorelines is prohibited. And so um, legal building of seawalls in that way down a coastline, um, it wouldn't be legal. But we are seeing, um, you know, a lot of desperation out there where folks will just go out and take it upon themselves to harden themselves. So, um, yeah, it is a big problem that we're seeing. And it's difficult to know what'll stop that. And Chip, when one of those is taken out, what happens in that whole system that you were describing? The neighboring walls get flanked by erosion and they start to collapse. But I can tell you there's a law review article that's going to be published this fall by an absolutely brilliant law student from uh, UH uh, Richardson Law School, in which he argues that beaches are a public trust and that every time a homeowner goes in and asks for a permit uh, to, to, to harden the shoreline or to do anything on the shoreline, it opens up the opportunity for the agency, the government agency to say, well, no to your seawall. And by the way, you now allow us to look at all the neighboring properties along this beach and they are all destroying the public trust. And we're gonna have all of these walls taken down. Now, this is a theoretical law argument. It's going to be published in the law review. Uh, there was, in fact, an entire day forum at the law school last year based on this student's analysis. Um, but all of that has been ignored over decades and decades of Hawaiian um, permitting and coastal management because uh, it is the, pro the rights of the private property owner that have reigned supreme and there has not been a proper voice for nature. Shelly, we've talked a lot, I mean, not Shelly, sorry, Lauren, we've talked a lot about the, the sea walls uh, and the sandbags, but there's also this thing called a sea, uh, I want to say it, it's a sand burrito, <laughs> very technical term. I think that most people have seen these, they're basically cil cil cylinder sandbags. Tell us about the effects of and the impacts of those. 
it's essentially exactly kind of what Chip just described. Um, they essentially end up acting like a seawall uh, and stealing sand and creating flanking for surrounding properties. And even the picture that you saw of Kahana, you know, when you think of sandbags, you kind of think of the, the bags filled with sand that you put in front of a door when, when a flood's coming or when a hurricane's coming. These are not them. They, they are huge. They're not manufactured here. They have to be brought in, shipped in, and they're like, you can walk on them. They're like rocks. So when they're left in that system, they essentially do become like, uh, like a seawall. Um, and not only that, but their life, I think is like five years. So then they actually start breaking down and then getting the material that's all stuck in that bag um, into, into our environment, which is also not natural. So there's a lot of problems with the emergency permit and the sand burritos. Um, it's a Band-Aid. And, you, you know, I think having kids has taught me to have more empathy. So I'm, I'm trying to have empathy and, and, and be humbled for the people who um, own oceanfront property and understand that um, that is their home and, and that is a very important place for them. Um, and there is that need to want to protect and, and shore up your home. But I'm glad that Chip brought up the public trust because in Hawaii beaches are public trust and the state has that constitutional obligation to protect them. And even with a, a sand burrito or a sandbag, um, we're, we're not protecting the beach. We're continuing to protect the private property, which is where a lot of the emotions come in um, from both sides of it. Chip, I think there's something that you're trying to show us here. So let's take a look at <laughs> that. <laughs> Those are burritos. Uh, that that's pretty extreme there because you see the neighboring houses. Uh, you were just now, now you're blocking it. Actually, can you show us that one more time? Yeah. And this is Sunset Beach, right? Uh, that's that's Cammy's. I I actually took that picture uh, yeah, with the, the state's yeah. drone. Yeah, that's the Cammy's area. It should. Yep. And yeah. Another problem that we're seeing with uh, these these burritos is that they're typically not engineered by a certified contractor. So they come apart. And so you'll see like broken boards, nails, um, tarp material ending up out in the shoreline and on the beach, which makes for um, a potentially dangerous uh, situation for the public. And just to kind of promote, uh, I don't know if it's self-promote, but um, during tomorrow's board hearing for the DLNR, um, I'll be presenting on the state of Hawaii's beaches, and this will be a big part of that, the issues that we're seeing with these structures. Well, there's a, there's a question here. I'd like you to follow up on that. Um, this person via Facebook says, isn't the problem with stopping seawalls and sandbags the many exemptions that are granted to homeowners? What is the process right now, and are these just being allowed to essentially go in when we see a big storm? Uh, well, kind of the thought behind emergency permitting is, um, you know, when you have an episodic event, like an El Nino event or something where it truly is episodic, then landowners can protect um, the shoreline using these structures that would otherwise require full on permitting that would require environmental assessments, et cetera. But it's kind of short circuited so that the homeowner can do that temporary protection of their land while that episode passes. And so what we're seeing now with chronic erosion is that they're not coming out. Is that like, yeah, it's, it's a tricky situation because without these sandbags, a lot of structures in the back shore would fail. And so, yeah, making that choice between shorelines and inland structures, it, it's a tricky one. And if you try to choose both, it's like riding two horses at the same time. And we all know how well that works. Presley, do you think that it's time for us to let some of those structures go, even though, of course, it would be very painful for those homeowners? Yeah, um, Young, young G, um, I think, I think um, that's the reality of it. You know, I, I think cert, there's going to there's going to be certain property loss. I I don't see any way around it. You know, you know, man. Even though we have good intentions, every time we try and fix situations, they're only they only 
exacerbate the problem. You know, like I, I, I'm not, I'm not for any kind of groins. Uh, I'm not any for any kind of seawalls. I'm not for bagging anything. I, I think if we just, you know, you got to accept what what nature is going to do. And every time we we put up, we're making more obstacles for the natural flow of, of what happens. You know, in a certain area, we don't know. Uh, and I think that's that's why it's important that we just let nature do its. Uh, I hate to say it, but let it let her do her 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 course. You can't can't change nature, you know. And and we again look at. I don't see why. Um, I I have a hard time grasping why this why we feel responsible for somebody that you know you know you know like I said, look at. The future is in the past. Look where our kapuna built, built. You know, where are the people of this the original inhabitants of, of the Hawaiian Islands? Where did they build? You know, so it should be like a dis, a disclosure or whatever. When 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 uh, um, you know some realtors sell a piece of property, you just say this is a disclosure. You know, you you know land you're you're this close to the ocean. It might it might take it. Mm -hmm. I don't see why then we, all of a sudden the state of Hawaii. We're burdened with this with this task of saving saving properties, you know. So yeah. I, I have a hard time. I, I don't know what the solution is other than you know re retreat and letting think. Again, I gotta go back to Haena and look what's happening. You know, we we have sand dunes there, and when the wind comes, you know, the beaches like overnight they'll change. They'll go 10, 20, 40 feet in a night, you know, but you let sand. Re let it flow and let it'll it'll it's amazing how it, it can replace replenish itself if you just let it let it let it do its thing you know i i i i'm just really against any kind of uh invet revetments or any kind of seawalls and sorry that's that's just my opinion Chip, I want you to expand on that, if you would. This whole idea of letting nature take its course is incredibly painful uh, for, for, it will be for a lot of communities. Um, is it really an inevitability? And if it is, what is our timeline? You know, I know we started out talking about that study and that said that in the next 30 years, we'd lose 40%, but it sounds like if that's the case, we better start moving now. We better start moving 20 years ago. Um, so, uh, First of all, I think, Shelley, I don't know if you recall, but did uh, the legislature at last year's session finally pass, uh, uh, Lauren's nodding, finally pass, uh, well, Lauren, why don't you explain what, what they did? I think you're gonna say the sea level rights disclosure bill. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, they, they did. So actually exactly what, what Presley was saying, sort of now when, when you, well, I guess it has to take effect, but when you buy a property that's in the sea level rise exposure zone, um, you, it, it's disclosed that you're in the sea level rise disclosure zone and certified are pushing for that bill. Part of that was to help close the loophole of these emergency permits. So then if you buy a home that's in that, then you are taking on as the, as the new homeowner, you're acknowledging, okay, I know where I'm buying and I can't turn around to the state and the counties, um, in five years and ask for an emergency permit to shore up my, my home or my property um, because I, I already took on that risk and understanding what the risks are when you're purchasing in such a highly dynamic area. Yeah, in this case, so it's not just erosion, it's also flooding by high waves. It's, it's various types of hazards, including erosion related to sea level rise. It's all been mapped out around the state uh, and now it's embedded in, in uh, real estate transactions. You, the homeowner must be made aware that they're buying a property uh, that's in this hazard zone. Uh, it's a, you know, kudos to the state of Hawaii and the legislature. They've made some wonderful moves. I think this is a national, uh, a national leadership move. In fact, it's, it's probably international in scope. I don't know of any place else that that has done this. Uh, Yanji, to your question of letting nature take its course. Well, I understand the Dutch have a have a saying: uh, you go to war with water, and you will lose. And all we have to do is look around our shoreline where people have gone to war with water, you know, tried to protect their property. They might have a nice gleaming seawall for a few months or a year or two, but then eventually it ends up destroying the beach, wrecking the public trust, wrecking uh, the 
tourism-based economy, um, just the, the amount of loss is, is enormous and it, it cuts across all sectors of human interest, uh, all for a single parcel. Now, I know I'm coming across as the tough guy on these parcels, and I'm sorry about that, but sea level rise is a permanent aspect of coastal communities for centuries. Take a look at the new Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that came out this past August 11th. It said that we're looking at over a thousand years of sea level rise as the oceans warm up to the same temperature that the air is, they will thermally expand. That's a long, slow process. So sea level is not going to suddenly turn around and start going down. It just It is not in the scientific reality. So we need to completely renovate how we manage our shorelines. And it needs to be in favor of protecting and recovering natural ecosystems. Well, to that point, uh, Mike and Kailua, and we have about five minutes, so I want to make sure that I get to each of you uh, with a question, but I want to start with Presley. Mike asks, are there lessons, uh, are there any lessons that people on other islands can learn from what is being done on Kauai? Um, I think, I think, you know, this whole process, um, it's all about communities, no matter what your what community you are, I think it just really just comes back down to having a good, strong community community and, and or or a group of people. Doesn't matter if you're you're born and your family came from that particular place or you have genealogical ties to the place. There's nothing stopping you from going and taking care of a place and and doing whatever you can plant plant some elima down at the down at the ocean you know and start doing things like that you know and and, and get a group of like surfer rider what they do is you know wonderful work what they do so i think um that's 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 the only thing i can think of that um we can learn uh, and uh, just, just malama your place and lauren with, your... with surf rider in mind what can the average person do to get involved and to help this issue because it does seem just so overwhelming yeah, I absolutely think going back and, um, you know, Auntie told me, know your backyard, right? Know your beach. It, it starts with just observing it and, and knowing it and understanding because then you then you can speak to it, right? And you can speak to this, those changes. I think a big part of what everyday citizens can do as well is really be involved in, in the policy and the political process. Um, and you know, get on our mailing list as surf rider because coastal coastal protection is is one of our five key things that we do, and we're trying to integrate the public more into these processes and um, being able to you can testify really easily through the the state of Hawaii online system and having your voice heard and. Um, sending a short email, sending a I support, getting on Zoom and providing testimony is is really powerful, and um, it's actually really accessible. Uh, one of the silver linings of COVID has made that more accessible. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for the public to be more involved in the political process and to be pushing to to move back from the shoreline um, and to understand this really complex process, but to s s just stand up for our beaches and, and our coastlines and, and demand, you know, that that the state start seriously looking at how we can um, ex equitably move away. And we have just about in a minute and a half, and I want to make sure I get to Shelly and to Chip. So Shelly, if you could expand on that about people getting involved and what they should take away from this. Lauren did such a great job, but yeah, speak for your beaches, fight for your beaches if, you know, um, Beaches are something that we all enjoy from from like the baby that's enjoying like learning the beauty of the ocean from the folks walking their dogs along the shoreline. Um, from the fishermen catching food for their families or beach parties. Um, we need beaches and so like speak for your beach fight for your beach if you see anything going on on the shoreline um, that you think might not be permitted check always like call your. Uh, DLNR enforcement and just check. Um, that's a good thing. And Chip, I want to give you the last word tonight. Well, so many wonderful things have been said. Um, 
I would just add that, you know, we don't need to invent anything new. Uh, you've seen the breadth of this conversation. You've seen the, the depth of knowledge among all these uh, different stakeholders here on the screen. Um, the community needs to be led, I believe, by government, opening up the opportunity for all of us to get together and come up with these solutions. Um, it's not going to be easy, but the resources exist for understanding this problem. Um, and, and I can also tell you there are resources and they, to, to assist homeowners from getting away from their doomed location, and it doesn't necessarily require money. There are other, there are other resources out there. Okay, well, thank you so much. I truly enjoy this conversation. We, of course, want to thank our guests, coastal geologist Shelley Habel, earth science professor Chip Fletcher, Lauren Blickley from the Surfrider Foundation, and Malama Kua'aina board member Presley Wan. Next week on Insights, for years, a Hawaii Island man has been fighting to obtain a license to carry a gun in public. We'll discuss how a similar gun rights case before the U.S. Supreme Court could put our gun laws to the test. Please do join us then. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha.